Louisiana's um, honored us by coming to accept the Building Bridges Award. Every couple of years, every year, we give this Building Bridges Award to um, Muslim and Christians who were accomplished in the field of building bridges, uh, Muslim Christian understanding. The second uh, uh, person on the panel is Dr. James Ogby, who is the co-founder of the Arab American Institute, and he continues to serve as president. He's also the director of Ogby Research Services, a firm that has conducted groundbreaking surveys across the Middle East. We have Todd Detheridge, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Telos Group, whose mission is to equip Americans to build a transformative pro-Israeli, pro-Palestinian, pro-peace movement through the resourcing of leaders at the nexus of culture, faith, and enterprise. And um, we have our own Father Drew Christensen, a Jesuit priest who is also a distinguished professor of ethics and global human development at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, and also a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And we have moderating our own, especially Yvonne Haddad, professor of the Science of Christian Understanding. I, there are books for sale. Both uh, Bishop and Mead and Dr. Dogby have uh, some of their publications over here. But we only have a small number. So if you want one, as soon as the event ends, go buy one. Don't consider that you can mill around and they'll all do a copy. But obviously, you know, don't jump over anybody. Um, but anyway, um, so thanks very much. And uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll proceed with the panel. Okay, the least amount of time, you have the names, and we're going to go in the order they are on the sheet. And we, I'm delighted we have a stellar group of speakers. At the same time, 
what we see in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and other places is deeply concerning. At the same time, the daily life of my church and my people has not been affected by the bloodshed and persecution now facing many members of the churches in the Middle East. I therefore have the role to play in speaking out against the chaos, injustice, occupation faced by so many of us, by many sisters and brothers in Christ, as well as our neighbors. Although my situation is not, in dire, is not as dire as theirs, we still face problems, and we have to all these problems. Secondly, I want you to know that Christians in the Middle East are often harmed by some external efforts to describe or respond to the challenges we face. Over the crisis of the past few years, we have found that some Christians are taking the opportunity to claim Arab Christians as their children, treating us as dancers in distress who need to be rescued from our Muslim neighbors. Whether this sort of rhetoric comes from Russia, Europe, the United States, uh, Arab Christians strongly reject this paternalistic, neo-colonial approach. I mean, if I want to look, for example, for Jordan, many people say, and I would say, maybe Jordan today is the best country for Christians in the Middle East. Why? 75% of the Jordanian economy is built on Jordanian, on local Jordanian Christian involvement. Why? Because they live in peace, in stability, and in security, and the government is considering them equal citizens. Christians are also flourishing in Lebanon, where Maronites have a very strong role in shaping political culture. It's true that we have religious freedom in Palestine and in Israel, and we are not persecuted for our faith. Our primary religious challenge is access to holy sites. Israel issues barriers to Christians on feast and celebration, as it does for Muslims. But this, this of course, happens in the context of ongoing military occupation. And the, that political reality, as opposed to specific, to religion specific reasons, is what is driving our current existential crisis. The rate of Christian out of migration from Palestine. In November 2017, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung released survey data regarding Christian and Muslim attitudes in the West Bank. The survey found out 23% Christians and 1% Muslims said that one of their relatives immigrated in the past year. The economic situation and political situation were the top reasons for immigration. Only 9% of Christians listed social or religious reasons. 28% of Christians responded said they, are, they were considering immigration themselves to the United States or Canada or Australia. An important survey also was done in 2008 among Palestinian Christians in the West Bank, home to home. Four reasons why they are immigrating. The first one is the lack of peace based on justice in the horizon. The second one, is the measures of occupation. You have, you, I don't know if you have lived under occupation, that God didn't, but if you like to experience what occupation means, you are welcome to see us in Bethlehem and Jerusalem and to see what does it mean to live under occupation and what does it mean to our younger generation because over 65% of our, of our inhabitants are under 30 and they are experienced, you know, the occupation, and I have lived all my adult life under occupation. Thirdly, the deteriorating economic situation. And fourthly, 
you know, the growth of extremism both in Israel and Palestine. One of the questions was, are you persecuted by Muslims or Jews? You would be surprised. Less than 1% wrote as a factor, religious persecution as a factor in their decision to immigrate. Less than 1%. In other words, religious pressure from Muslim leaders has very little to do with the most pressing concern of Palestinian Christians in Israel and Palestine. Western efforts to demonize Islam and Muslims create problems for Christians in Israel and Palestine. Some supporters of Israel to bolster state's narrative that it is the best suited to protect Christians by using the fact that some Muslims in the Middle East are mistreating some Christians. This narrative is strengthened even while the Israeli Knesset it passes law granting Christian special privileges in Israeli legal structures. A law passed three years ago asserted that Christians, unlike Muslims, are not Arabs, but Arabians. And we don't speak Arabic. <laughs> Under the guise of protecting us, we Arab Christians are being severed from our cultural and ethnic heritage and from our co-citizens, the Muslims. Any concept that Arab Christians are someone set apart from broader Arab society threatens to undermine our participation in those societies. While we are concerned about extremism, we are equally concerned about such, such attitudes who would stand up, who would stand up for Christians. We expect that our partners around the world will stand up with us, with us as Arab Christians, but we will stand for ourselves. This is what we call in Arabic, smooth, steadfast in the country. The Middle East is facing an unprecedented spike in religiously sanctioned extremism. No community in the Middle East is immune from extremism. We are seeing extremist attitudes among Muslims, Jews, and Christians. In order to stand against this wave of extremism, we need now more than ever an educated, engaged populace ready to take on the challenge of navigating between the sometimes competing forces of religious commitment and good governance. In other words, we need to promote a robust form of citizenship for all people in the Middle East, in Palestine and Israel. This citizenship needs support from participatory, grassroots institutions while society needs the common protection of an agreed upon constitution that protects all persons equally in societies informed by citizens enjoying equal rights and accepting equal responsibilities, all human communities will be able to flourish. And sometimes in the Middle East, when we speak on equality, there are some who are more equal and some less equal. We want all to have the same equality, and that's a challenge in the Middle East, and especially in Israel at the moment and in Palestine. There are some people today who think that Arab Christians are not, nothing but a minority in the Middle East. They prefer to think of us as dilemma, subject to Sharia law, or Milla, an autonomous community along by Syria, or to distinguish us from the Muslims by saying we are a minority, an unimportant minority. People who think like this forget that Arab Christians have been in the Middle East since the Pentecost. Since the beginning of Christianity, we Arab Christians, including Palestinian Christians, have been an integral part of the Arab society. We are neither Dilma nor Milna nor Iranians, nor minorities. As an integral part of the Arab society, the joy of the people of our, are our joys, the struggles are our struggles. We have carried the gospel of love among our people for 2,000 years. I am not a stranger in the Middle East, and don't I consider myself a minority? I am an integral part of the fabric of the Palestinian society. No legislation or attempt to manipulate Christian identity can change it. Not even 
the recent nation state law that does not give Christians or Muslims the right of self-determination in our historic Palestine. The challenge for our Christians today is to promote notions of equal citizenship and equal rights. It's my conviction that these goods can only be enjoyed under democratic constitution that respect human rights, including gender justice, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of expression. Promoting these values for the good of our society is an important role Arab Christians must play today. Thus, while we gather here to celebrate the notion of global citizenship, we must also commit to take this step in support of local citizenship throughout the Middle East. The situation in the Middle East can be described in theological terms. We can see the suffering in the Middle East as the outcome of many people and groups living in Corvartus insane, turn into <coughs> inward on oneself. This is a phrase used by Augustine and made even more famous by Martin Luther to describe the condition of human beings as being focused on themselves alone, rather focusing outside themselves, living for God and for the name. The future of Arab Christianity and Palestinian Christianity is not in war, nor under occupation, nor in, nor in promoting extremism or in segregation. The future of Christianity is in peace based on justice in the whole Middle East. This is the reason. I believe solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is very significant and very significant for the, in, in allowing all the people in the Middle East to live in peace and justice and reconciliation. Even I believe the core problem of the whole Middle East is the Palestinian-Israel conflict. Once you solve it, you can solve Syria, Iraq, and other issues. For this reason, we continue to believe that the two-state solution living side by side on 1967 borders, and Church Jerusalem, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, Palestinian Israelis, shared the capital for Israelis and Palestinians, the, right, the, the political solution for the right of return, and ending of the policy of settlements, and sharing natural resources, as well as regional cooperation, are the elements of solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and stopping the immigration of Christians. We also believe that Syria and Iraq must have a robust political solution if they are so Christians want to immigrate, strangely they will stay in the area and with their Muslims as they did in the, in the Muslim regimes build together our societies. That's the strength of the Middle East. Today, there are many Muslims and Jewish communities and even Buddhists who are writing in the media that the immigration of Christians is very dangerous for the region. It's very dangerous. Why? Two reasons. One, other Christians are the, are the balancing power in the Middle East. If there are no Christians in the Middle East, the conflict will be, will be seen religious and not, and not political. And this is the reason Muslim and Jewish colonists are writing, please stay in the country because our conflict is political and is not religious. That's some last year. The second point, Arab Christians play and continue to play a constructive role through our health services, education, and social services in the Middle East, we play a very positive role in promoting diversity, pluralism, identity, as well as the value of democracy and equal citizenship in the whole, in the whole Middle East. 
This is the reason I am really very clear with you the decision that the White House has taken to deny or to, to not to give aid to health in each Jerusalem hospital, it will affect our Augusta Victoria Hospital and Marcasset Hospital. It's the only, Augusta Victoria Hospital is the only hospital that needs cancer. Don't use cancer patients and heart patients as hostage for political purposes. For us, what we are doing, we don't serve Christians in these hospitals and these schools. We serve Palestinians who are in need of our services. That's the strength of Palestinian Christians in our area. This is the reason. I don't understand. For this reason, you know, my question is, and you have to think very seriously, what is Jerusalem? without Palestinian Christians? What is the Middle East without our Christians? It will not be the same Middle East you are, we, we are living in today and we have lived for 2,000 years. If Christians are not there, I promise you, extremism will more grow. If there is no justice in the Middle East, I promise you, that the jihadist mentality will more and more grow, and the settlement mentality will more and more grow. Christians are the balancing power. For this reason, we continue to serve our society, regardless of our numbers, regardless of our, of our deficits in the budgets, because we believe that the service we are giving to our society is for the whole society and not only for Christians. That's the strength of Palestinian Christians in, the, the, in, in Palestine and Israel. Please continue to support our Palestinian Christian strategy to serve every human being, regard, regardless of gender, religion, of ethnicity. As long as we do that, then we are strong in the Middle East. Thank you. more on naming and shaming than on working to 
solve problems. That guides not only the language they use, but the work that they do. And finally, they often do this without consultation with the leadership of the Christian communities in the region. Um, and that creates problems of the language they use and the approaches that they take, um, which often are not constructive to really solving problems. Let me provide you with a couple of examples from my time on the commission. I had been on the commission for just about two months, in December of 2013, and I was still getting acquainted with the dynamics and the work of the commission when the staff circulated a draft, draft op-ed for which they sought approval. The piece began, in quotes, as we enter the Christian season, Christians look joyously ahead to celebrating Christ's birth in a manger. But across the Middle East, the cradle of Christianity Followers of Jesus are under siege and live in fear. Will Christianity survive in the area of its origin? The piece went on to describe the plight of Christian communities in Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. And for good measure, they added Nigeria and Pakistan. I had a number of concerns with the draft. And so despite the fact that five of my colleagues had already quickly indicated their approval, that was the way we worked. You had to get six approvals, and then it would go out. And oftentimes, my colleagues, some of whom were deans of law schools and professors, distinguished professors at Harvard, whatever, never read the damn things. They would just sort of check off. One, one piece began um, during World War, a, a hundred years ago, in the midst of World War II, Armenians were expelled from, well, without an edit, you know, immediately got five approvals. Um, Anyway, the, the piece went on to describe those groups, and, and I had a number of concerns, and so I made my dissent known. I wrote, how on earth can we publish an article about the plight of Christians in the Holy Land without even mentioning the Christians in Bethlehem? The way the article is written, covering as it does the span of the Middle East and throwing in a few Muslim countries to boot, and skipping over the plight of Christians in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Nazareth, the birthplace of Jesus and his home, um, simply doesn't sit well with me. These Christians are also suffering, losing their lands and ability to survive under harsh occupation. The wall, settlement construction, etc. confiscated Bethlehem land, the closure of Jerusalem, choking the city and forcing its residents to leave. I might add, I, in the letter I wrote, while many of the facts of these other countries might be right, the overall tone of the article troubles me I fear it will not be helpful to the very cause we seek to promote. I followed with a longer statement that said, after a number of my colleagues had responded, that you can't be comparing the situation of Christians in Israel, that's how they refer to it only, um, to the situation in Syria. And I said, to be sure, the problems faced by Palestinian Christians are different than those confronting their brethren in Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. But their suffering is real. And to ignore them, especially at this time of the year, in an article that is supposed to be about Christians in the cradle of Christianity, is both insensitive and painful. A piece that is silent on Palestinian Christians will simply not be credible to Christians and Muslims across the Middle East. My second concern is with the language used in the draft to describe the situation of Christians in other countries. Of course, their problems are very real and deserve our attention. My question is, as the article concludes, were the Christians in these countries, um, uh, my, my question is, will Christians in these countries be well served by simply naming and shaming and targeting Islam, as is the case when you throw in Nigeria and Pakistan? Um, it looks more like, it sounds more like an evocative, uh, unsettling political broadside against extremist Islam than a Christian season appeal based on, as the article concludes, with the universal message of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I then attached something that Drew had given me a statement by the bishops of the Holy Land, hoping I said that this language might be helpful to you. Um, it wasn't. A number of days and after a number of email exchanges, it became quite clear my Republican colleagues and a few Democrats were adamantly opposed to any inclusion of the plight of Christians. And my colleagues 
were more interested in scoring points with their ideological patrons in Congress than in responsibly addressing the plight of Christians or making changes in their conditions. They said in a number of their exchanges, this is an issue we've never talked about before. We need to have a discussion. I said, that's great. Let's have the discussion in the new year. But one year later, when I brought the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem to meet with the commission, I discovered that no rational discussion could be had. The Patriarch presented four issues before the group. One was the impact of the wall that Israel was building on land owned by a Catholic convent and monastery in Cremesan Valley would do irreparable damage to both the, the monastery and the convent and also to the communities that they serve, separating the children from the school that they were going to, etc. Taking land that was for uh, olive, uh, olive trees and also for grape vineyards that make wine. Uh, secondly, the hardships imposed on Palestinians by Israel's refusal to allow family unification in Jerusalem. Um, if a Jerusalemite marries a Bethlehemite, they have to live in Bethlehem. They cannot live with the, the spouse in Jerusalem because Israel does want to add new people, um, meaning new non-Jews. The restrictions that have been placed on freedom of movement of clergy coming in to uh, the West Bank and, and, and also wanting to go into Israel. And finally, Israel's effort to create a Christian ID that would separate Palestinians by religion. The reaction of my colleague commissioners was stunningly hostile. The patriarch was upbraided for criticizing Israel, and two commissioners even told him that he should use his good offices to go and tell Hamas to stop their violence against Israel. The patriarch left shaken, saying he'd never been treated in this manner. A meeting that we arranged with the very senior White House West Wing officials was more respectful, but resulted in no commitments and no action. I didn't raise the matter again with the commission for two more years, waiting until I felt I had sufficient material on hand to make a compelling case. We worked with a group of young Palestinian lawyers in the territories who prepared a year-long study dealing with Israel's violations of religious freedom of Christian and Muslim Palestinians. Their 92-page book was submitted to USERF and it was modeled after USERF's very own reports covering the very topics that they do and comparing the situation of Palestinians under occupation with the situation of, of people in Turkish-occupied Cyprus and Russian-occupied Crimea and Ukraine. These are two areas that are annually cited by USERF for violations of religious freedom. Exact same behaviors in the Turkish case and the Russian case also were applied in the West Bank um, and therefore we felt worthy of consideration. It's important to note that most of the concerns and the issues raised in the study were found in the State Department's annual human rights report on religious freedom, the section on Israel and the occupied territories, at least that's what it was called until this year. Um, it's a section of the Department of State report that I might add, while accurate, annually in its reporting is never considered or acted upon by Congress or by the State Department's own Office of International Religious Freedom. Uh, Palestinian human rights are reported on but not acted on. The study we submitted was accompanied by statements of support for its conclusions uh, and an appeal for the Commission to investigate the enumerated Israeli practices one was a statement signed by 34 religious leaders and organizations in Palestine, and another by 11 major U.S. religious communities, including the National Council of Churches, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, etc. These letters ask you, sir, in quote, to conduct a comprehensive review of religious freedom in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories consistent with the principles it has established with respect to other states." End quote. The reaction of the commission was somewhat hysterical, and I don't mean funny. Some of my colleagues were beside themselves in anger. It was literally a shocking affair to witness, refusing to consider the study or its petitions. After two contentious meetings, with all the Republicans and one of the Democrats opposed, the commission refused to even look 
and the situation. What was most interesting to me was the lack of any engagement on any of the issues raised. I felt confident that the book had not been read and the petitions had not even been looked at. They were dismissed out of hand. There was no defense of Israel offered because they wouldn't raise any issues. No questions asked about the violations that were presented. The main argument appeared to be, how dare you even suggest that we question Israel? In fact, over and over again, I heard from the dissenters, why are you singling Israel out for criticism? And my response each time was, I'm not singling Israel out for criticism. It's you who are singling Israel out as the one country that cannot be criticized. A couple of my colleagues came to me and said, you know, we've spoken to X, Y, or Z, the people who appointed them to Congress, and we've been told we can't support this. Another told me, um, I'm afraid that if we do this, we'll, it'll, it'll, it'll affect our congressional funding for next year. I would add that my Jewish colleague who supported me in the case, one of my uh, 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 Democratic colleagues, submitted an additional petition uh, arguing that Israel also violated the religious freedoms of non-Orthodox Jews. This too was flatly ignored and rejected. The lesson from these experiences is clear. Where Israel is concerned among policymakers, there can be no rational discussion of behavior. The political establishment in the United States remains deaf to the appeal of Palestinians, not because they don't know they're there, but because it's too controversial for them to, they feel, to adopt them. Pro-Israel political forces hold sway over decision makers. Right-wing evangelicals and hardline pro-Israel political groups effectively silence any discussion of issues that might lead to criticism of Israel. There is an intimidation factor. It's real, and it's not only in Congress, but also in organizations like USERF that were to defend religious freedom. The hardline pro-Israel groups act not only to protect Israel from challenges, now they're even taking a step further, aggressively moving on the federal and state level to criminalize criticizing criticism of Israel, labeling it as anti-Semitic. For their part, the Christian right, guided by their ideology, also offer unquestioning support for the state of Israel, which they see as necessary for the fulfillment of the awaited final days. I would add that three new members of the commission come from this religious orientation. Though claiming fraternity of Christians in other parts of the world, they turn a blind eye to the co-religions, the religionists in Palestine, who appear to them at best to be an encumbrance or a nuisance that has to be ignored. The result is that Israel operates with impunity, and the price for that impunity is paid by Palestinians, Christians, and Muslims. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Todd Edwards, and I'm not a Palestinian, and I'm not a parent, but I am a Christian. But um, I was trying to figure out the best thing I could, um, could add to this conversation. And one of the thoughts that occurred to me is that probably one of the best things I could do would be to talk about all the things I've learned from Palestinian Christians, because there have been so many ways I have been taught by the Christians I have met in Palestine and in the Holy Land. Uh, I won't go down that road very far, but a couple of things I think are relevant, and it's one of these words it was part of the conversation I was just having beforehand. Uh, there's a Lutheran pastor uh, that we should be known as well in Bethlehem, who gave me an, an insight uh, that has really kept me on the, this journey I've been on for many years uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the Middle East conflict and uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And it, it, uh, it's about you know, sort of how do you stay engaged when the reality doesn't ever seem to change in very helpful ways. Uh, people often ask when you work on this issue, you know, are you optimistic? Are you about thinking about things? And sort of, I would say if you're pegging yourself on a scale of sort of optimism or just pessimism, you definitely should be on the pessimist side uh, if you're thinking if you're working on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and issues there, uh, because the pessimists tend to have all the facts. <laughs> but the reality is there are other, there are other scales we can peg ourselves on. And this pastor in Bethlehem said, you know, it's sort of more like a choice between hope and despair. Pessimism and optimism are feelings and emotions, but, but hope and despair are something uh, that, a little bit different. And, and what we 
really can do is to peg ourselves on the sort of side of hope. And hope is not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's, it's what you do. You live and act in hopeful ways in order to try to live into a different kind of reality. And that's a whole different way to engage this. And that has been sustenance for me for many years as I've engaged on this issue, rejecting the whole idea about my optimistic today or pessimistic, but, but living into, into hopeful reality. The other thing I learned from Palestinian Christians um, was, was um, the deputy mayor of Bethlehem. So many of you probably know under Palestinian law, the mayor of Bethlehem uh, has to be a Christian because it's a sort of Christian town. And I was having a meeting once with the deputy mayor of Bethlehem. He wanted to show me something. And so we go out to get in his car. And we get in the car and I start to put the seatbelt on. He said, oh, no, 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 we don't, we don't use those here. And it just kind of struck me. It's funny, as an American who's always accustomed to buckling myself in. And I realized kind of like, if there are so many things in your life, in your life that you can't control, you're really centering on those things you can. I don't have to wear a seatbelt, so I'm not going to. And that was kind of a freeing concept for me, too. So not all things I've learned in Palestinian Christians are of equal value, but I think that's a good story as well. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about our work at Telos um, and how, how sort of I got involved in this and, and why I think it in some way uh, kind of gives a bit of a, a, a response to, to the things that Jim uh, shared about the, the very broken politics that exists around this issue. Um, the shameful truth is that many Americans, particularly Protestant evangelicals who have, um, who play a very important role in this country, don't even know that there are Palestinian Christians. It's more than that they haven't met one. They really honestly, many don't know that they exist. They have no idea in the land in which their faith began the land of Jesus, a community of Christians existed since the first century, and that they are Palestinians today. They are the ones who are maintaining a living Christian presence in the face of enormous challenge in the Holy Land. And I was actually once one of those people who didn't know, but I've spent the last many years of my life working in one way or another on issues that are related to the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Initially at the U.S. State Department, where I worked in that Office of Religious Freedom that Jen talked about, and I worked on that report that he talked about. Uh, and that was actually what took me on my first trip uh, to Jerusalem as in during the Second Fog, uh, to look at the impact that the wall was having on religious freedom. Um, and for the last 10 years, I've worked with an organization that I co-founded called TELUS. TELUS is an educational nonprofit based here in Washington that forms communities of peacemakers here at home to bring, uh, help to bring healing to intractable conflicts. Uh, and our focus in this work is to educate Americans about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in ways that help them become supporters of peacemaking, diplomacy, and conflict resolution for Israelis and Palestinians. Knowing that we can't solve their problem, but knowing how much more challenging we can make it when we create policies and we create uh, activism around it that makes it harder for them to, to achieve uh, good ends. And I'm as convinced today as I was many years ago that the Christian community in the Holy Land and the role it plays there is both influential and essential, and as Bishop Dinan uh, said, it's integral, I would say. Uh, at the same time, it's small and in, in, in a way you could say even at risk. When I first began to travel in the Middle East, I was still only vaguely familiar with the historic Christian communities there. And that was that trip, uh, and then, then I made that uh, initial trip to Jerusalem in 2004 as a part of the Office of Religious Freedom. I met with Jewish Israelis and Muslim Palestinians, but because I was there to look at religious freedom issues, for all the people of the land, I had meetings with Christians as well. I met with Franciscan brothers, and Melchite and Orthodox priests, and Rosary sisters, and Protestants, and even with Palestinian evangelicals. I visited them in their churches, and in their schools, and their hospitals, and orphanages, and homes for the elderly. And I was there during the Second Intifada, and my purpose, again, was to look at the uh, impact the, the security barrier or the separation wall was having on religious practice and religious institutions in the Arab neighborhoods, and East Jerusalem in particular. And I found a community doing amazing things under severe conditions, but determined to remain. As an American and as a Christian, I felt very implicated in what I saw. I realized that if the actions of the people in my community and the policies of my government were not aimed at honest conflict resolution, then we were doing a disservice to all the people of the land. But to Palestinian Christians, perhaps most of all, since they are such a small minority, Christians perhaps most of uh, all, uh, it struck me that unless the situation changes in our lifetime, we could witness the virtual disappearance of a living Christian presence in the Holy Land. 
This would not only be a tragedy for the Palestinian Christian community, but also for the global body of Christianity. And it would also be a tragedy for the Holy Land itself, for all the reasons that Bishop Yunnan articulated. It was actually a Jewish Israeli friend of mine who's, ta who's taught me something. He said the three faith communities make an invaluable contribution to the city that he calls home, to Jerusalem. He's fond of saying that a Jerusalem without Christians is like Florence without culture. And since my first visit there, I've devoted time and energy to helping educate other American Christians about a few important realities. The first is that the Holy Land is not populated just by Jews and Muslims, but by Christians, uh, who have this long and obviously deep connection to the place. Secondly, that the Christian presence is diminishing largely due to the pressures of the conflict, as Bishop Yunnan also articulated. In fact, it's fair to say that the Christian community of the Holy Land is in peril, and ironically, some of that is the fault of their co-religionists here in the U.S. and in the West who operate from theologies and political ideologies that ignore their presence and write them out of the story. Thirdly, the Christian and Muslim communities that make up Palestinian society live to a very large degree with mutual respect and friendship, which is, of course, counter to the narrative that many Americans have. Um, and in the modern era, they're connected by their joint commitment to a Palestinian national identity. Fourthly, if you care about anyone in the Holy Land, Israelis or Palestinians, Jews, Muslims, or Christians, then you should also care about conflict resolution and peacemaking in ways that honor the deep historical ties and religious claims of each. And of course, many Americans do care about the Holy Land, and in some ways therein lies the problem. But it tells us we believe that too often we've channeled our passions about the Holy Land and the conflict between Israel and Palestinians into activism that mirrors the conflict itself. To be pro-Israel is often to be anti-Palestinian, and to be pro-Palestine is often to be anti-Israel. And this zero-sum game we participate in makes it hard for the parties to solve their conflict, but it also has the result of stoking tensions between Jews and Muslims here at home and in fomenting Islamophobia and anti-Semitism here in our own country. At best, most Americans have only a limited understanding of one side of the conflict, and the presentation of additional facts and information have their limits in persuading people to change their minds. And of course, if we could argue people into a different point of view, Twitter and Facebook would have already solved all our problems. <laughs> At Telos, we found the best way to draw Americans into a helpful position, one that supports the historic connections of both people to the land, and the national claims both sides make on it, and one that honors the religious connections Jews, Muslims, and Christians each have, is through human interactions, experiences, and relationships. When Americans meet Palestinians and Israelis face to face, when they share a meal with Muslims, or spend the Shabbat with Orthodox Jews, they open themselves up to the idea that there is no future for anyone there unless there is a future for everyone there. And for many Americans, the entry point for this is the Christian community. When American Christians meet and spend time with Palestinian Christians, it raises more questions uh, than provides answers, but they're good questions that must be asked. The reality is that Christians exist, the numbers are small, the role they play is essential. They have good relations with their Muslim neighbors that are not being persecuted by them. They don't teach their children to hate Jews. And at the end of the day, they are people, just like everyone else, with good and bad among them, and within them, just like every other people. These things make a profound impression on American Christians, and it opens them up to the reality of the other people in the land, Muslims and Jews. But because we believe there is no good future, as I said, for anyone, unless there's a good future ever, for everyone there, uh, or what works for one, what has to work for the other. We call this approach mutual flourishing. And there are some obvious impediments to this, because it all sounds nice, right? Mutual flourishing, we all like that. It's very kumbaya if you think about it. Uh, but we're, we're up against something very difficult. Uh, and the, the impediments are, I think I'll list four. Um, the first is theologies, and uh, Janet alluded to this too. Theologies that see events, even wars in the Middle East in terms of biblical prophecy and ne necessary prerequisites for the second coming of Christ. And the most no notable among these are the political applications of Christian Zionism and eschatology known as dispensationalism. Christian Zionism arises within certain sects of Protestantism after the Reformation, most notably Puritans. It is a belief that the return of the Jews to their ancestral homeland is, pre is predicted in biblical prophetic writings and was further articulated in the 19th century by an Anglican clergyman named Darby. 
uh, and an eschatology known as dispensationalism, which is a, a, a again, it was created in the 19th century. This is not an historic reading of, of uh, scripture. Today, there are a number of mostly evangelical Christians in the West, though importantly, by no means all evangelicals believe this, but an important number who believe the founding of the state of Israel in 1948 and the Israeli control of the West Bank and the Western Wall and the Temple Mount, which resulted from the 1967 war, are evidence of God's unfolding plan, and as such, they offer unqualified support of Israel and all Israeli policies. A second and related challenge, uh, in addition to weaponized theologies, there are political ideologies that dehumanize groups of people and give preference to war and displays of power. And this is particularly true for those who see global events through the paradigm of the clash of civilizations perspective. Thirdly, historic and contemporary fears and hatreds like Islamophobia and anti-Semitism that deny the inherent uh, human dignity of Muslims and Jews is an enormous uh, in, uh, challenge uh, that people face who are trying to pursue these kinds of aims. And finally, um, just a lack of experience is an impediment. Most Americans actually don't have a passport, and yet we project enormous power into the world. Many Americans care passionately about events in Israel and Palestine, and have never been there, nor have they met an Israeli or a Palestinian. Well, at Telos, we're trying to address these things in our own way, uh, and it's only a small piece of a much larger puzzle, but through experiential learning, we teach, us, us, we teach skills to Americans and, that help them think differently about seemingly intractable conflict in places like Israel and Palestine, about the limits of violence and war to achieve good ends, and about the principles and practices of people who engage in peacemaking. Here are a few things we do, and I'll close with these. Uh, we teach people to listen. We expose them to a variety of viewpoints, from Palestinians and Israelis across a wide spectrum, teaching them to listen to things they haven't heard before, or to things that they vehemently disagree with. This, of course, has the benefit of helping people better understand different perspectives to challenge their own assumptions, uh, but it also humanizes the people that are being listened to. You are, you are acknowledging someone's humanity when you take the time to listen to their point of view. Secondly, we show them the dangers of dehumanization which is related to listening. And we demonstrate that part of the work of peacemaking is to rehumanize people who've been dehumanized. This is particularly important uh, as we live in a time where there's so much dehumanizing language. As, as Eugene Peterson uh, has said, we cannot be too careful about the words we use. If we start out using them, and then we end up using us. The only way to sustain a project of oppression or violence against a people group is to create a narrative that they are somehow less than human, and it begins with language. And I would say when you want to argue for the human rights of a people, uh, you first have to persuade the people that they are actually human beings. And it's a, it's a horrible thing to have to, to deal with. But that reality of dehumanization is such an important part of how we have to take these things on. Thirdly, we expose them to the work of those who are doing the work of reconciliation and justice and disruption. And one of my favorite stories is actually tragic one. It's the story of a group known as the Parent Circle. Some of you are probably familiar with this organization. It's made up of about 600 Palestinian and Israeli families, about equal numbers from both sides. The thing that they share in common is that they each lost someone they love, a direct family member in the conflict, and they've chosen to reject uh, any notions of revenge in pursuit of reconciliation. Not just personal reconciliation, but to be agents for and spokesmen for um, reconciliation and their larger community. Just a few months ago, a Jewish Israeli mother, a friend of mine uh, named Robbie, who was in Chicago, was speaking about the loss of her son David, who was killed by a Palestinian sniper during the Second Intifada. Robbie's first response when the Israeli soldiers came to tell her that David had been killed was to say, you may not kill anyone in the name of my child, which is such a, an unbelievable thing to say. Uh, she, but she immediately somehow rejected the idea of revenge out of hand and began to walk a road of reconciliation. And in this event in Chicago recently, she was joined by a Palestinian Christian woman from Bethlehem. Her name is Najwa, and her 11-year-old daughter, Christine, was killed by Israeli soldiers, also during the Second Intifada. And the power of these two women, one Israeli, one Palestinian, one Jewish, one Christian, standing together before a group, before a group after group, uh, telling their stories, pleading for both sides to do the hard work of peace is an inspiring thing. Um, and so I just I will I will leave you with the, with that story about the real people there because I think as we as we think about these uh, issues in the Middle East and Israel Palestine and these 
in these global ways, we always have to keep reminding ourselves and rooting ourselves in the lives of the real people there. Uh, in so many ways, we have imported this conflict into our own culture, into our politics, into our churches, and we, we've created activism around it. And there's the conflict, and we weigh our flags, and we feel really good about the way we've chosen our team. We know who the good guys are. And in doing that, it may feel really right, but we are often doing it at the expense of real people uh, whose, whose lives are actually directly affected, even to the point of uh, these parents who've lost their children in the conflict. So we, we root ourselves in the people who live there. And I think it's really important for the Christian community to be that a source for many of us in the West to understand their reality, to connect into them, and our responsibilities to, to listen to them and our ability to learn from them. And that's why I, I'll sort of end with where I started with this. It's the many things I've learned from the Palestinian Christian community in my many years of travel. So thank you very much. <laughs> I wanted to uh, thank the center for inviting me and uh, being on the panel with such fine and distinguished people. I will work very hard on this issue for so long. And I want to thank all of you for coming. The familiar faces there, the good faces. I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, since I spoke at the center in April, uh, following the change of American policy in Jerusalem, there's been a whole barrage of uh, events attached to U.S. policy to uh, so it's just culminating in the last few days in the, the cancellation of all the aid uh, that the, the, the UN agency supports Palestinian refugees, and then the expulsion of the, uh, the Palestinian uh, mission here in Washington. Uh, amidst that, uh, a small little dispute uh, among Catholics has been overlooked, but it, it's potential because it's uh, potentially important because it represents an effort uh, to bring Christian Zionism into Catholicism. It's called Minimal Catholic Zionism. Um, it's a challenge to the, uh, the official Catholic position that uh, the church maintains religious relations with Jews, but uh, diplomatic and political relations with the state of Israel and Palestine and so on. But that they need to be distinguished. Uh, and there's great reluctance on the part of some people, particularly those located in academic centers who are involved in, in Jewish dialogue, to, uh, to, to accept that distinction. Um, drawing, drawing on the Second Vatican Council's declaration on non Christian religions, Master uh, Tate, Bristol University's Gavin uh, De Costa, in a January interview with the English journal The Cabinet, um, I think I got some time because the lights are less there. Then, in a March 3rd article in the tablet under the title Search for the Promised Land, Professor De Costa gave puzzling treatment to the Holy See's promise that relations with the State of Israel are a matter for diplomacy defined by international law rather than, than the matter for religious wants. And what he did was he basically backed off the drift of the interview to accept a lot of limitations that would be found in the, the official Vatican position, but still wanted to press on for recognition of the rights to the land. Christian Palestinians question this application of the biblical promise to today's Israel. In his 1993 pastoral letter, Reading the Bible in the Land of the Bible, the Patriarch Emeritus of Jerusalem, Michael Sabah, asked, does the Bible, as the word of God, give the right to the Jewish people today to appropriate the land for themselves, and in so doing, to dispossess the Palestinian people? Drawing on the religious history of the two peoples and the, th and the three religions, Patriarch Sabah turn the tables on the idea of the promised land. Today, if one of the three religions were to claim, in the name of religion, a political right to the land, he wrote, then the other two religions would have the same right to the same claim for the same reason. That is, they are all descendants, physical or spiritual, of Abraham, to whom God promised the land. In fact, the constant text steps to distance himself 
from extremist Zionist positions in Israel and the U.S. He accepts much of the Vatican position that borders should be settled uh, by, by negotiation in conformity with international law, and, and that the freedom of Jerusalem should be ensured by international guarantees. Now, by the freedom of Jerusalem, I think, is meaning basically the free movement of pilgrims to the city. I don't think he's referring to uh, the rights of Palestinians in the city. He even concedes that the Palestinian homeland is a matter of justice, granting that it is as important as the church's rapprochement with Judaism. In their 11th pastoral letter released at Pentecost this year, the Council of Catholic Patriarchs of the Middle East wrote about Israel-Palestinian reconciliation. Friendship with the Palestinian people is not a difficult thing, they wrote. It means treating them on the basis of justice, equality, international resolutions, and the exigencies of the Palestinian people which are the least the people can ask to live in their own land. Those elements of justice are missing from today's radical Zionism. In biblical theology, however, justice was essential to covenantal Judaism, and ancient Israel's failure to act justly was repeatedly at the root of the people's alienation from God. With the views of the land, 70 years of uh, of Israeli-Palestinian history. The last 30, 30 years of the settler's expansion, and the, uh, the warrants for further expansion in the new fundamental law, making Israel a Jewish state, observers must ask, how firm and deep is Professor DaCosta's acceptance of the justice elements of the Catholic position? In the brief time allowed to me, I would like to make we joined it to minimal Catholic Zionism in two parts. First, I will sketch a biblical theological argument for the official Catholic position on religious warrants uh, attached to the claims of the land. I will make the case that the post exilic Judaism and New Testament Christianity provide backing for a non-exclusive universalistic understanding of the land. Secondly, I will trace the groundwork for a theological understanding of the Vatican's diplomatic approach to today's state of Israel, rooted in university human rights. I am conscious that, uh, that the issue of, of, of the land in Christian theology, even in the Bible itself, is more complicated than I have time to, to explain here. There are universalist elements in the Torah, um, uh, the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures, but they're overshadowed by the, by the exclusivist text. By contrast, the post to a, a prophetic tradition has a universalistic vision of, 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 of the Holy Land. The prophetic view, with justice at its center, I would underscore, is held by the majority of American Jews today. For prophetic Judaism and Christianity, Universalism is the prevailing outlook. As my confrere Bill Stone used to say, during the exile, Jews deprived of the land had to learn to live with God in a new way. That new way is summed up in Jesus' reply to the Samaritan woman, a time is coming we will worship the Father neither on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, uh, nor in Jerusalem. God is spirit. And the worshipers and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. After the exile and return, prophetic Judaism re-engaged the land as a stage for the salvation of all peoples. All the nations of the earth will stream to it. Many, many peoples will come to it, uh, wrote Isaiah. Psalm 97 is the high point of this tradition. It reads in part, when those who know me, that is who know God, I mentioned Rahab, Babylon, behold Philistia, and Tyre, and Ethiopia. This one was born there, they say. One translation reads, Jerusalem is our mother. The inclusion of Babylon and Philistia, Israel's historic enemies, illustrate how all-inclusive all the prophet's vision of the promised land, represented by Mount Zion, uh, is. 
Christian Zionists and would be Catholic Zionists would do well to learn and adapt the prophetic universalism as the proper Christian form of Zionism. Well, there is evidence that early on Jesus understood his mission to be to the lost sheep of Israel. The burden of the New Testament is also universalistic. People who come from east and west and north and south read the Luke's Gospel and will take their places in the feast of the kingdom of God. In continuity with the post-exilic prophetic tradition, election is transmuted into a universal call, and the virtues of the land a transfer to the eschatological kingdom of God, where justice rules. Justice, the bond of the covenant, is now to be realized in a new community, a new people of God. What seems lacking in the Costa's minimal Catholic Zionism, however, is not only the prophetic uh, shift to universal uh, inclusion, but also acknowledgement of the countless acts of injustice against the Palestinian people perpetuated over the last 70 years and more. Israel today is not a covenantal state, but instead the, uh, the projection of human will in keeping with the revisionist Zev Jabotinsky's iron wall strategy on which a Jewish ethnocracy is being constructed. The ethnocratic character of the state is emphatically evident in the new basic law uh, uh, by virtue of the, the authorization of unlimited Jewish settlement of the Palestinian territory. A political theology and diplomatic option, the diplomatic option. Catholic theology, in contrast to evangelical thought, does not uh, draw exclusively on the biblical sources, but it's just uh, for its justification. It draws equally on tradition and especially on church teaching. The two documents that establish the basis of Vatican diplomacy today, including treaties with Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, are Vatican II's uh, Constitution on the Church of the Modern World and uh, the Declaration on Religious Liberty. The two documents affirm that the object of all government is the defense and promotion of human rights. Um, they likewise insist on the equality of all before the law. That includes the Declaration on Religious Liberty. The Declaration of Religious Liberty forward stresses that religious liberty must be understood in light of the complex rights that give people, uh, that give the public form to human dignity. The Declaration on Non Christian Religions, Nostra Tate, that includes a declaration uh, which includes the Jews and Muslims, I submit, should not be read on its own, as, uh, as uh, Professor DaCosta is doing. It ought to be read in light of the centrality of human rights to the Declaration on Religious Liberty, a parallel document to the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions, um, and Vatican II's fundamental commitment to serve the world through defense of human rights. Accordingly, any Catholic who would grant priority to members of one religious tradition over others, as minimal Catholic Zionism would do, is out of tune with the mind of the Council. Catholic affection for the Jewish people, and our respect for the historic blessings they once received, need to be understood in light of modern human rights. And the prophetic uh, universalism that stands behind them. It twists Catholic teaching to argue that the promise given the Jewish people in antiquity provides warrant to ignore concrete injustices committed by Zionists against the Palestinian people from the late 19th century through the early 21st century. Overlooking the actual history of Israel, Israeli-Palestinian relations becomes a tacit authorization for the ongoing expropriation of Palestinian lands, the diminishment of Palestinian rights, and potentially the expulsion or transfer of Palestinian people from their land. To paraphrase the prophet Jeremiah, we know Catholic Zionists may cry, justice, justice, but there is no justice. Thank you.
Hi, yeah. thank you for being here today. Uh, one question I have is, uh, the more I educate myself and learn uh, from such as yourselves, uh, the policies of Israel in the Levant region, within its borders and outside of it, I can't help but ignore there really is no difference with the apartheid in South Africa. Yet, the whole world seemed to condemn that apartheid. Today, we don't see that condemnation worldwide. That's quite infuriating. Is there, do you really, in your professional opinions, I should say, is that because the Israeli government exerts a lot of influence over foreign governments? Is it just because of the religious Zionism that each religion seems to hold? I think there's a growing recognition, uh, certainly after the nation state law was passed. Um, and I think that uh, uh, here in this country, uh, we're seeing a demographic divide in the public over the recognition that Israeli policies are, um, are in fact as deplorable as we know them to be. Um, application of the use of the word apartheid to this is comparatively new. It, it, it's something that even those of us who were advocates uh, didn't use with the, the frequency or intensity that we currently use it. I think it is an apartheid regime. I think that, that it has been that in the making. But they have hidden behind a rhetoric um, uh, of wanting peace, of wanting separation, of wanting uh, equal rights protected for the Arabs who lived in Israel, the Palestinians who were citizens of the state. But the mask is off, and I think that it becomes increasingly clearer and easier to make the case. Now, there's a caveat, and that is that um, look at what is happening in the Labor Party in England. Look at the legislation that is being passed here in Congress, and in some 20 or more states. Um, and the recent decision actually yesterday by uh, the Department of Education to um, include criticism of Israel as uh, intimidating Jewish students and therefore qualifying under the anti-discrimination provisions of Title IX. Um, and I think this is all very, very worrisome. So we're, we're as we make an advance, um, there are some efforts to retard that advance. But I, I, I do think that that, that the, the issue is, is, is one that is, is, is beginning to be recognized more seriously. Yeah, thank you very much, I think, for this. This is a very important question. I would like just uh, to add to what James has said. You must remember that half of the Israelis are against the new nation state law. And they have written, even in Jerusalem Post, which is right wing, and us and others, that we are driving our country to apartheid. And they themselves use the apartheid. You know, if you think, if I spoke when I spoke about the Aramians, you know, there is a group which is 150 people in Nazareth who we have a problem with them, who think they are Aramians and Christians. But the idea behind it was they were encouraged by the state in order they can be drafted in the IDF. And 150 of them are now drafted. Why are they drafted? Not because they want to defend the state, but they want to carry, you know, arms mm -hmm. in order if the Druze or the Muslims who are serving the army have arms, they can answer them. This is a very dangerous one to think. And for this reason, we have to be very careful. I myself really, with this new nation's law, when you are denying Muslims and Christians, Palestinians and many Israelis self-determination in Palestine, in historic Palestine, 
I think you are you are making the country, you know, uh, an apartheid country. And we should not allow this is not good first to the Israelis. I was just want to add uh, Barak, who used to be the former prime minister, who didn't succeed to make with Clinton you know, and Arafat the deal at Camp David. Last February in uh, in Herzliya, they have always this kind of political uh, arena where they discussed. He said, if we don't give Palestinians from the river to the 1967 borders their own state, and we are seeking for one state solution, I'm afraid Israel will be apartheid, and we cannot defend ourselves for the international community, not even the United States. So I mean, that's the danger about it. When we are speaking, it, I mean, you spoke about criticizing Israel and so on. I think, you know, we are not bashing Israel. We are speaking about violation of human rights. And Israel is a state like any other state. If I have, if I have the ability as a Palestinian to criticize the United States of America's policies, the Congress or the president, why can't I also, because they violate human rights, because they cut the funding on UNRWA. 9,000 people will be dismissed from their jobs. What, what are you seeking when you are not funding UNRWA? Where will the people go? Where will be educated? That means we are allowing those refugees to become extremists or whatever you want them to be. This is very dangerous. We, are, we have the right to criticize the violation of human rights and the illegal occupation of Israel to the territories. If we don't criticize it, then we allow it apartheid to continue. But another reason why they're in, in, uh, interested in joining the military is because years ago, Israel had a problem of how to address the issue of a whole series of social benefits provided by the state. Um, and were those social benefits going to go to Arabs as well as to Jews? Um, in an effort to not pass a overtly discriminatory law, the idea was that only those who served in the military could receive those benefits with an exception made for Orthodox Jews who were not, they didn't want to serve. Um, and, and, and so, because only Jews could serve in the military and Druze, uh, the Arab community was excluded from receiving the social benefits. So there's an incentive uh, being presented to these uh, Arameans, as they call themselves, to join the military so that they qualify for the benefits. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. The um, Episcopal Church in its um, convention in July passed a resolution that um, will have the House of Bishops uh, drafting a pastoral letter that will go out to all churches and institutions on the subject of Jerusalem, uh, the status of Jerusalem, and the meaning of it uh, to our church and, and all Christians. So with that as the background of something that needs to be developed as fully as possible, um, and I hope perhaps uh, you all would be interested in assisting that, um, what is uh, the Christianity of American mainstream, let's say, Christians, without Jerusalem? And what is Jerusalem without Palestinian Christians living alongside other Palestinians, in which I include Jews? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, you know, uh, the good news is that your presiding bishop, Bishop Michael, has a different point of view than many of the bishops there. And we are aware of that. And we pray that God may give him health because he had, you know, the surgery, you know, just three weeks ago. So, I mean, he is really thinking it's, it's true. I mean, the issue of Jerusalem, I mean, we spoke about Christian Zionism. And sometimes you think that we are criticizing too much Christian Zionism. But we are not seeing the danger. They are influencing this administration. 
take on Jerusalem. I mean, if we want to be on Christian Zionism, Drew uh, uh, spoke very kindly about these things, but I would like to be very more bluntly. I mean, the Christian Zionism say that Israel is the fulfillment of prophecy, the present Israel, the state of Israel, which is against our own understanding. Secondly, they believe that the Jewish people, the Jewish people, not the Israelis, the Jewish people must have hold on all Jerusalem in order that it can be a prelude for building the third temple on an, on an Haram Sharif, which is of course very dangerous. And building the third temple will drive them to Armageddon. So I mean, I spoke with one of the Israelis, uh, sorry, the rabbis, I told him, what do you think about these Christian Zionists? He told me, as long as they support the state of Israel, we are fine. But once they will use their Jesus, not my Jesus, and use this word in Armageddon, the IDF will deal with them. <laughs> so, I mean, we have to be careful. I mean, maybe the Israelis, some Israelis, they like Kufi and others, but they know at the same they are not good fellow in the bed. So, I mean, we have to understand, but I really sometimes, I really ask the American churches, especially the churches, and those evangelicals who don't believe in the Christian Zionist point of view, to more raise their voices on Christian Zionism. Christian Zionism is dangerous for Americans before Israel and Palestine. If you are quiet and complicit, you are allowing them, really, to expand, and you are allowing the next administration to be much more, you know, a much more, uh, uh, have unjust policies than even this one. So you have to speak and make the American people more aware. It's not the issue of abortion or contraceptives, where you are electing your president or you elect your, you know, uh, your candidates for the, for the uh, Congress or for the Senate. These people, the Christian Zionists, they have their own agenda, which is very dangerous for the world, and which is an apartheid system, which they are promoting. If you don't really stop them and make awareness for the American people, I'm afraid for the Americans more than afraid for us Palestinian Christians. Can, can I say one thing about the Jerusalem thing too? I, I, th I do think it's really important for American Christians to appreciate that they that they there are Christian equities in Jerusalem that they need to understand and be willing to uh, support and it, because uh, I mean it has to be done with humility. I mean we have a history of Christian interest in Jerusalem from outside the region that looks like the Crusades and the Crimean War and things like like there's a whole history that has to be fully understood. So we, we do have to approach with a lot of humility, but the idea that this is sort of a Jewish Muslim thing about the Temple Mount and the Haram al and we just got it. Like, the, there are actually Christian communities there, Christian presence there, Christian mission there, uh, that all has to be, that should be, that people should care about. So when there are, when there's a Lutheran hospital on the Mount of Olives that's serving cancer patients from throughout the West Bank and Gaza, that is now being you know, denied American funding that has been so instrumental for a long time. That, that's actually the name something we should actually care about, right? And so when Christian mission and Christian presence in Jerusalem is threatened or undermined, um, we should actually realize we kind of, I, I hate the language that we have a dog in that fight, but we have some, we, it's like we have equities there and we ought to be willing to step up uh, and speak out in those kind of situations. Just, just on the issue of Jerusalem, I, I like to speak of the city and its people. Um, there's a, there is certainly the religious aspect to it, but there's 300 plus thousand Palestinians. It's not just Jerusalem, it's a swatch of the West Bank that includes 28 Palestinian villages. Um, now, in some weird way, become neighborhoods. Um, I, I like to think of the Beltway um, when, I, when I talk about it. Imagine if Maryland, were to um, annex everything within the Beltway on the Virginia side, 
and call it Wash Greater Washington, and it's now theirs. Think of what happens to the people in Northern Virginia who can't get in anymore, who work here, um, and who travel into the city every day, because Washington is the metropole. It's the hub of cultural, social, political, economic, artistic. It's all of these things inside the Beltway that people come to. Think what happens to the people inside the Beltway when the closure occurs. What do their businesses do? Where do they go for work? Um, who will come and shop in their, in their stores? Who will keep the cultural, artistic, and whatever institutions going? Because they're locked in and even can't go to Maryland because they're now just part of this little enclave. That's what's happened in Jerusalem. Um, unemployment has soared. Poverty rates are astronomical among the Arab community in Jerusalem. And this includes Christians and Muslims. I mean, I have gone to hotels and you, the guy working the night clerk has a PhD in psychology but can't have a clinic. He says there's more cases that I could be dealing with now because of the stress and tension, but there's no money to pay me. And my clients who used to come from the West Bank to, to see me, uh, they can't come in and I can't get out to see them. I mean, this is a, a human disaster, and they call it the holy city. And so we think sometimes about the theological aspects, but there's this very concrete issue of what's happened to people in the city that we oftentimes uh, ignore. Plus, the strategy that Israel's used in Jerusalem, as well as in the West Bank, which is the one they used in Israel proper from 48 on, which is because Palestinians had collective ownership of land uh, not individual property, individual plots. Um, they confiscated the land around the towns and villages and created basically what we would call landless peasants. You know, you lived in the village, but your land, which was outside that you work, you no longer could have access to. When you see the West Bank with these little circles, that's what you've got. You've got Ramola now completely surrounded, Bethlehem completely surrounded, with people having lost all the ability to grow property, <coughs> values in the city go sky high. They complain about, oh, our poor settler children can't find homes, we've got to expand the settlement. But kids inside those little enclaves also need new homes and can't get them. They're strangling Palestinian villages. You look inside that circle of greater Jerusalem at least 28 quote unquote neighborhoods, little villages, you see these little tiny communities completely surrounded by modern, uh, this these concrete behemoths that surround them, um, it's literally choked off life. Just, just very briefly, Steve, I think if you look at the papers the last couple of weeks, particularly the last couple of days, Jerusalem is just, uh, and, and the recognition is Jerusalem is the capital of Israel by the US government, was just the camel's nose under the tent. What you have going on right now is complete uh, evisceration of any Palestinian strength in any in any kind of negotiating process. So when when uh, it's not only the taking away of support from UNRWA, but the redefinition of refugees to just those who were expelled in '48, uh, you, you you have an uh, and then uh, break down the diplomatic relations. You really have a situation in which the Palestinians are being wiped off the board, but the Trump administration. And I think, I think we really need to think about it that way. Hi, I'd like to thank you all. My name is Patrick Theros. I do have a dog in this fight. I represent the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem in the United States. Uh, and one issue, I try to avoid making commentary as opposed to asking a question, but one issue that has changed dramatically in the last year has been the yeah, as quickly as I can. Uh, has been the encouragement of the, of the Israeli, certain elements of the Israeli political state to essentially eliminate the ability of the churches to support themselves in Jerusalem uh, by different uh, legislation. There's a law pending in the Knesset for the confiscation of the church land. You take the land away, the churches cannot support itself. You effectively end the presence of the churches in Jerusalem. This is an issue of importance to us, and I hope the panel might want to address it. Well, I think, you know, there are two agreements between the Vatican and, and the State of Israel 
and the Vatican and the Palestinian Authority from 1993 were they respect the historic status quo of these churches and that there will be no change neither for taxation or economic without further negotiations with the Vatican and signing, you know, a new uh, agreement on the economic privileges or economic rights of the churches. Now, this has been challenged in February, or in January, in fact. In January, because I think, you know, there was a disagreement between the Minister of Finance and the Mayor of Jerusalem. And of course, they made it clear to the media as if we Christian churches are taking the money of the state, and which we are not taking it, and not paying it to the state, and the municipality of Jerusalem won't succeed if they don't get 650 million shekel, which is something like 200 million uh, shekel. Uh, dollars, US dollars. So, um, the three, I mean, the three churches that own the Holy Sepulchre, the major ones, they decided to close the church of Holy Sepulchre for three days, you know, in protest to what happened. Now, these violations of those agreements with the Vatican, they are very common and we are every day as heads of churches dealing with it every day. Because every now and then they read the law or the agreement in a different way. And by the way, the Vatican until today, since 1993, until today they are negotiating on the economic, uh, economic rights of the churches and they did not conclude it until today. So it will still take more time because there are issues which we cannot allow it, you know, to happen. For example, property tax. If we want to pay property tax as churches, then we'll hand all our churches to the to the state. Uh, I mean, we cannot pay it. Or if we, if you ask us to pay to pay, you know, taxes for monasteries and for places which we own, we cannot do it. Or you ask us to pay taxes for property which we own and maybe we rent it in order to pay our hospitals and our schools, we cannot do it. So there are issues that we are really dialoguing, the Vatican is dialoguing because it's a state, you know, and the Vatican is telling us, once we get an agreement, it will apply on all other churches. I think this is one of the issues that has been very sticky, very difficult in the last months, and when the Prime Minister of Israel himself intervened, it was talked and promised that they will find a committee. Now that committee is not working. I think they have got the message. If you close the Holy Sepulchre, the world won't be quiet. And I think the Holy Sepulchre was the first step. There were other steps that the heads of churches were going to take in order to prove that the status quo in each Jerusalem, the historic status quo, not the de facto status quo. The historic status cannot be changed. It must be respected all the time. Sabir, we have Al-Dikar, 
we have the Kairos movement, uh, we have VR, we have many of those who are working, you know, um, and explaining to the people from a theological point of view the violation of human rights, and who are saying always, you know, that um, that they should, uh, we should really understand the Israeli political, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a political, not religious. Now the problem is that on the, in the Palestinian society and among Palestinian Christians, we have two schools. One school thinks we, there must be a hermetic BDS against, you know, the whole state of Israel. The other school says that we must boycott only the settlements because even according to the U.S., you know, State Department uh, definition, settlements are illegal. And anything that is produced there is illegal and, and must be boycotted. Now, the Sabir maybe it is promoting the first school, and that's the reason why such groups like, you know, this that are in the United States, Israeli groups, they are really calling it dangerous. But it's not the only one which is called dangerous. There are others who are called it. Once you speak for justice and human rights, you know, many of us are in the same club. You are then immediately defamed or immediately, you know, given the impression that uh, you are uh, you, you are not important or how many do this this Sabin or that priest was called Naim Atik represent nobody and then they call them anti-Semitic. Now I want to say anti-Semitism was raised here. You know that we Palestinians are never anti-Semitic. Even living under the occupation, we will always fight any kind of anti-Semitism that is really uh, that is the original understanding of anti-Semitism, which we learned in our schools. But if anti-Semitism becomes, you know, criticizing the policies of the state of Israel, or Zionism, or occupation, then you are calling me anti-Semitism. I think it is depreciating the meaning of anti-Semitism. And we Palestinians, we will continue our original understanding of anti-Semitism and fight in our societies anybody who will work for anti-Semitism. But the violation of human rights under the occupation, we cannot keep quiet. And it's not anti-Semitism. However important it is to talk about theology and dogma in relation to the land, I think we need to talk about the human story of the Christians of Palestine and the region. A few of you mentioned St. Augustine Hospital, the St. Victoria Hospital. I know that they have been for 10 years battling in the court to expand the hospital because of the needs at stake, and they have been so far refused the right to expand in their own land that has historically been owned by the hospital. So how, how can we speak of the human story, the human narrative of the Christians of Palestine? Number two, a few years ago, I led a delegation called American Imams for the Christians of the Middle East, with the hope of involving Imams around the world of becoming a united voice for the Christians of the Middle East, but for sure Palestine, believing that the birth of place of Jesus cannot be empty from the followers of Jesus. So my question to you, before I ask a question, as a Palestinian Imam, as an American Palestinian Arab Imam, I'm not looking for a Muslim Palestine, but rather for a Palestine where Jews, Christians, and Muslims could live side by side. Now my question, what is the role of clergy in telling the story? I mean the clergy in the United 
United States or the clergy in, uh, in Jerusalem and you see, because where we have many clergy. Well, let me uh, put it in this way. Uh, first of all, thank you for your question. And uh, yes, the Augusta Victoria, we succeeded on many things. And I think it's a Palestinian success story that we have a hospital with cancer treatment, with no expatriate or foreign working. All of them are Palestinian doctors, Palestinian nurses, Palestinian you know work. And that's part of our policy as churches, or as a Lutheran church also, is to empower our people. For, you know, when you are working with cancer, we have very expert you know, doctors in cancer using linear accelerators and all these things. This is a success story that we have to see it is positive. And, that, and we have to look at the positive of that. Now, I want also to say that there are nine churches in the United States that have taken very positive statements in the church-wide assemblies on Palestine on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And these nine churches are paying prices. Heavy price because they have really, they have really spoken and they have spoken what they were supporting. And in fact, some of the price is not only from governments. Some of it are internal politics. Where some of those who are in the Christian Jewish dialogue, they oppose it and then they go outside and speak negatively on their own churches. Right. So our role is, as clergy, in those at least nine and other churches, to promote the issue of justice. I always tell people, you know, I don't want you to be pro-Palestinians, but I don't want you also to be pro-Israelis. I want you to be pro-justice, pro-truth, for peace or reconciliation. Once the American clergy and the Christian Zionists and others follow these four things, then I can see a hope in a better situation. A shameless plug. My book, it's Matt Perry. Um, I wrote it four years ago um, and have not changed a word, just reissued it. Because it became increasingly clear to me that the problem that I looked at there, uh, it remains the problem today. You cannot talk about human rights um, if you do not recognize the humanity of the people who are being, whose rights are violated. And that's what, that's what Israel did. Um, it denied the, the very humanity of the people. Remember the film Exodus? It was funded as a propaganda film to humanize the Israeli side and to dehumanize the Palestinian side. It was modeled after the cowboy and Indian scenario, which we all grew up with, I mean, my generation grew up with, with cowboys being the sort of the, the pioneers on the frontier trying to carve out a space for themselves so that they could live and prosper with their families, being confronted by these savages who had no respect for, for humanity at all. And that's how they saw it. I mean, the, the, the Israelis were blonde hair, blue-eyed, you know, people who wanted to just love and live and be free, and they're confronted by these murderers. That defined it then, and it remains today what it is. And so the issue is really a critical one that remains with us both today and it has become more intense as we move forward. I mean, the greater the recognition of Palestinian rights by, by millennials, by African Americans, by other minority communities, uh, the, the more intense the fight is to not only defend Israel, that's not what they're doing, it's to dehumanize and denounce the Palestinians and make them just simply unacceptable as people. So elevating human rights is the thing they most fear. Because implicit in elevating the human rights is recognition of the very humanity of the people they've denied, both Muslim and Christian. No, I just wanted my brother to have the floor, but since you called on me, I'm Tom Gettland. 
And these are beloved brothers who have taught me a lot too, and I'm very grateful for this event today. May I just point out that, uh, a shameless plug, uh, that at the recent Washington Report conference, there was attention paid to the issue of Christian Zionism. I think for the first time in a major way. And it's on YouTube, you can get it on YouTube by using my name or other names of the speakers that day. And those articles have been published and have pretty wide circulation. So all is not lost. Uh, we do not live with a lot of optimism about tomorrow, but we do live with a lot of hope about day after tomorrow and the future because because we know who gets the last word, mm -hmm. and it's not Trump. My name is Clyde Christopherson, and I'm not even remotely related to any dog in the fight. I'm, I'm here because I know Drew. Uh, I have a parallel in my question. The parallel is between the preservation of the Catholic Church and the preservation of Israel as kind of goals and objectives, driving goals and objectives. Um, the other part of the parallel is the turning a blind eye to clerical sexual abuse and turning a blind eye to massive relational injustice uh, is the only way I can describe it. It sounds all very, very depressing. And uh, I, mean, I like Todd's notion about hope, because uh, you know, the spirit is, is, is at work here, at the, and you know, particularly among you know, the people, you know, the local people there. But in the, in the first part of the, of the parallel, uh, you know, we did have a spotlight shown on by the Boston Globe. And my question is, is there a possibility of some similar <clears throat> turning around in this uh, such a massive blind eye to injustice? Yeah, let, let me say that uh, uh, it's been very hard for media to be able to focus on, uh, honestly, on what's going on with respect to the Palestinians. Um, one good friend of mine was the head of the, he's the, head of the Boston Globe office in Jerusalem and, and about a problem and always be told, well, you have to tell the whole story, you have to interview the other side, and then by the time you want to end it up, you can do it. I think, um, the best broadcaster on this issue was Peter Jennings, who went there and found his own, uh, uh, found the truth, and was very committed. But he's very unusual, and the, the media watch that's kept by the Jewish Defense Organization is quite extensive. I mean, every year when I was in America, I get a dossier like that There's one here right about now. things I had said or things the magazine had said. All the, the biggest kind of inference, and uh, and even in, in the formal dialogues, it became clear in my last years there that we weren't going to be able to talk about these concrete issues that divided us because our Jewish colleagues were getting their instructions directly from the embassy. So it really made it very difficult. Well, I think, you know, I don't like to make a person because for me, you know, there isn't a comparative suffering. I don't like to make it because, you know, I would like to say, just to end this, you know, symposium, if we Palestinians are getting our full human rights and dignity, and occupation ends, and occupation ends, and we have our own democratic state. And it's true what the Imam said here, that we don't want a state with a religion, but a state that respects 
the three monotheistic religions equally and with uh, freedom of justice, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, what we experience. And Jerusalem is our capital as Palestinians. I promise you, we will have excellent relations with the Israelis because I think our problem is to end the occupation. Give me justice and I will be really satisfied. Why should then I fight anybody? I want to live in peace and dignity. We Palestinians are as normal human beings as you Americans. <laughs> <laughs> we are not exceptional. Everything relative. <laughs> Give us our justice and we will see a different story. And please, we spoke about hope. I don't believe in politicians. They are not their own interest. We have only one God, who is the God of justice, and we will never allow injustice to continue. Justice will come according to this own plan, maybe not according to our efforts. Thank you.